games used to look like this, and then they look like this, and then for a while they look like this, and now they look like this. As you probably know, the thing that made this transition possible was the advancement of computing power. Perhaps more than any other medium, games are restricted and shaped by the technology available to the developers, which you can plainly see any time you compare two games that were made a decade apart. But there's another element of games that's just as dependent on technological advancement to improve. Physics simulation. Just look at the canned animations of Resident Evil next to the dynamic ragdolls of the remakes, and I think you'll see what I mean. Fast forward to today, and the new frontier of simulated physics is in the real-time destruction of objects, which is a more complicated problem than it may sound at first. When a player cuts an object in half, they're essentially creating two new objects that now need to have independent movement and collision calculated for. Imagine a player doing this dozens, or even hundreds of times, as you know they will, and you can see the stress this might place on a game's engine. As time marches on and engines have become more powerful, many developers have flirted with the idea of turning destruction physics into a gameplay mechanic, perhaps most famously in Metal Gear Rising, but the freeform cutting shown in early trailers was eventually abandoned in favour of the more straightforward action game we got. The technological limitations of the time were only partly to blame, however, because once you have a cutting mechanic working in a game engine, you're only halfway there. Being able to cut things may be impressive, but you need to figure out how to make it fun or interesting to keep people playing. Otherwise, your whole game will look like this. Naturally, it was only a matter of time before we reached a point where destruction physics are feasible for smaller developers, and not just AAA studios. Now that we have, the question is open once again. How exactly do you make playing with destruction physics mechanically interesting? Hard Space Shipbreaker steps up to that question with mixed results. It's a game that wears its premise, not to mention its message, firmly on its sleeve. 300 years from now, the monolithic Lynx Corporation owns and operates most of the solar system's infrastructure. Struggling to find opportunities on an environmentally devastated Earth, you sign an exploitative contract with Lynx to work as a shipbreaker, dismantling old spacecraft at one of their orbital stations. Now billions of dollars in debt to Lynx, you owe them for your transport into space, for every tool you use, and for the oxygen you breathe. Lynx also takes ownership of your DNA, and reserves the right to generate a spare if you're injured or killed while working. All in the name of protecting their bottom line, of course. It's all inspired by the real profession of shipbreaking, and also, no doubt, by the gruelling conditions the workers are forced to operate in. During each work shift, your goal is to divide up the ship using your tools, and separate the pieces into one of three receptacles a processor for advanced materials, a furnace for basic metals, and a barge for electronic components. While you do unlock a new tool in demo charges halfway through, by far the majority of your playtime will be spent with the cutter and the grapple tools. The cutter has two modes, a focused beam that disintegrates the specific object it's pointed at, usually these clearly signposted cutting points, and a line cutter that can slice through surfaces in a more freeform manner. The grapple likewise has two functions. You can grab objects to directly move or throw them, and you can tether objects together or to solid surfaces to have them move on their own. Tethers being yet another thing you have to buy from Lynx in order to use. This cycle of dismantling and sorting is the core loop of Shipbreaker, but the game throws in plenty of wrinkles and new hazards to keep things interesting as you progress. Many ships come into the yard with pressurised interiors, meaning that you have to either carefully depressurize them from within, or risk a violent decompression by breaching the hull. Later ships have electrical systems and power junctions that need to be disabled if you don't want to risk being shocked. Dealing with a ship's reactor is often the most dangerous part of shipbreaking, as it starts to melt down when removed from its casing, and you only have a short time to avoid a catastrophic explosion. On top of all this, each work shift has a strict 15 minute timer, and you may need to return to the vendor for more oxygen, jetpack fuel, or tethers multiple times throughout a shift. Obviously I have some thoughts on the success of the game's mechanics, or I wouldn't be making this video, 
But before I can start dismantling the game and throwing its components into different coloured boxes, I think there's a bit of extra context needed. With its themes of corporate greed, the exploitation of the workforce, and ultimately the power of ordinary labourers to control an organisation's profits, you may have guessed that Shipbreaker is, unashamedly, a game with a point to make. And it's a timely one at that. A few of the game's mechanics work in aid of that point, and serve to put you in the shoes of someone being taken advantage of by a soulless employer. But I'll argue later that the vast majority of the minute-to-minute -minute gameplay actually works against the game's message. In moments where this conflict between message and mechanics arises, I'm sure the developers would have noticed and had a difficult time deciding which one to prioritise and which one to sacrifice. But I'll get into all that in due course. To their immense credit, the studio that made the game, Blackbird Interactive, isn't messing around when it comes to workers' rights. The team that created Shipbreaker did so on a four-day work week. I just thought that was worth mentioning because, seriously, hats off to them for putting their money where their mouth is. And finally, before I move on, I don't think this is the kind of game that will be ruined by spoilers, but if you're the kind of person who prefers to go in completely blind, here's your warning to play the game for yourself before you watch any further. So let's start at the beginning, before any of the more involved mechanics are introduced. On the small ships you start working on, you'll soon notice that the overwhelming majority of cuts you make with your tool are on these predefined cut points, which tend to be the same across different ships of the same class. Early on, you'll likely settle into a routine of getting inside a ship, severing all the easily visible cut points, and sorting the now free-floating pieces into their respective containers before dealing with the more complicated bits left behind, like the cockpit at the front and the engine bay at the rear. Once they've been dealt with, you're left with a simple metal frame for deposit into the furnace. Mechanically speaking, all you're really doing in these early stages is pointing at a few dozen yellow spots to make them disappear, and then moving the debris into the appropriate box. But the presentation and novelty of it is more than enough to carry you through. Even later, when many more mechanics are added, the core of what you're doing really doesn't change much, and that routine of getting inside, cutting and then sorting will continue to be applicable for the entire game. As you correctly deal with the various parts of the ship, the completion bar at the top of the screen will fill up, telling you what percentage of the ship's value you've extracted. At certain points along that bar, you'll receive a bonus in the form of Lynx tokens and merit points, used to upgrade your equipment and unlock new ships by advancing through the ranks. Any components that you destroy or sort incorrectly will appear on the opposite side of the bar as value lost from the ship. These bonus landmarks are the real key to progression in Shipbreaker, to the extent that once you've passed the final marker on a ship, you might as well end your shift there and then. The bonuses you get go up in value for each landmark on this completion bar, so you're incentivized to get as much value as possible out of each ship before moving on to the next one. Keep that in mind, because it will come up again in a second. It's worth pointing out that in your first shift, and in a few later ones that introduce new mechanics, you're given an unlimited amount of time to familiarise yourself with what you're being taught. While it's hard to imagine a ruthless megacorp allowing its employees an unlimited amount of time for training, I think most players would be willing to let this go given the importance of making sure the tutorial is understood before moving on. And at this very early stage of the game and story, you're not really likely to notice the dissonance anyway. Every shift besides these training ones, however, is on an uncompromising 15 minute timer. With upgraded tools and a good knowledge of the ship's layout, you can deal with one of the smaller vessels in a single shift. But when you still have a basic tool set and you enter the yard with a big new ship you haven't seen before, you've got absolutely no chance of extracting all the value before time is called. The first time you end a shift without having fully dismantled your ship, you might think, damn, I'll need to tighten up my timings in order to be fast enough on the next one. But you'll soon learn that's not the case. When you get up the next morning and head to start your shift, you're given a choice between several different ships, including the one you were working on yesterday, where you can simply pick up right where you left off. If you're still not done at the end of that shift, you could do the same thing again the next day. And because you're incentivized to get as much value as possible from each ship before moving on, well done for keeping that in mind by the way. Focusing on a single ship like this is usually the most sensible choice. And it's here where Shipbreaker's biggest conflict between gameplay and story emerges. 
On the face of it, the 15 minute shift time limit works in harmony for both gameplay and story, because it creates some urgency, forces prioritization, and gets the player thinking that time is money, which is the natural tendency for any profit-focused enterprise. Unfortunately, this is completely undercut by the fact that you're allowed to use as many shifts as you like on the same ship. Once you've internalized that fact, all sense of urgency is lost, and you know that you can take your time and don't need to prioritize. It just doesn't make sense that a corporation like Lynx would allow you to leisurely take apart a ship over several days, while other ships presumably piled up in the loading bay waiting for someone to see to them. I realise that this might sound like a nitpick, and nothing more than complaining about plot holes in a story that can easily be ignored, but I want to argue that making some changes here would not only tighten up the thematic consistency, but also make Shipbreak into a more compelling game with more interesting choices to make. From a gameplay standpoint of course, one benefit of allowing the player to use multiple shifts on a single ship is that the ship designs could become bigger and more complex which I imagine is what caused the developers to make this design decision, but I think I have a potential solution that sidesteps this problem. If you really did only have a single shift for each ship, then the player would truly be forced to squeeze as much profit out of every second as possible, something the story explicitly says we should be doing, but that the game as it is doesn't really encourage. This could be taken further by replacing the time limit with an oxygen limit, and removing the ability to purchase more oxygen mid-shift, having the shift end when the player either returned to their habitat, or suffocated from lack of oxygen. This would have multiple effects. First, it would give the player the chance to increase the length of time they get with each ship by upgrading their oxygen tank capacity, therefore being able to tackle larger ships. Second, it would make the oxygen canisters you sometimes find on ships into a truly precious resource, as they would give you a few extra minutes. And third, it would present the player with a difficult choice to make when they were running low on oxygen. Should they spend valuable time heading back to their habitat to end the shift alive, or spend the last waking minute squeezing out as much profit as possible to make that bonus, before suffocating and being resuscitated the next day for a fee, essentially trading their life for the extra cash. I can't think of a better expression of the story's themes than that, but again this would only work if you had just a single shift in which to complete each ship, and really felt the pressure bearing down on you to make your targets. Difficult decisions like this are sorely missing from Shipwrecker's gameplay, and almost all of my problems with the game can be traced back to the effectively unlimited time you have with each ship, or in other words, to the sandbox structure of the game as a whole. While I'm at it, dying and respawning is another mechanic that doesn't have much bite to it. It carries some story significance in the way that Lynx generates its spares, but in terms of gameplay, only amounts to a setback of a few seconds, as you're quickly respawned back at your hab. If dying ended your shift and carried with it a bigger penalty, then it would mean a lot more to the player. It's not really made clear in the game itself how exactly the generation of spares works, and it raises way too many questions that the game really isn't prepared to answer. I'll give some more examples of how Shipbreaker fails to give the player any interesting decisions to make, but before I do, let's take a quick look at Papers, Please for a second. A similar game to Shipbreaker in many respects, albeit a much simpler one. Each shift you work in Papers, Please, you get paid according to how many travellers you correctly processed and fined for mistakes. At the end of each shift, you have to spend that money on heating and food to keep your family warm and fed, and they can die if you don't. Thanks to this, you always feel that pressure at your back to squeeze every penny you can out of each shift. Most shifts add new rules to deal with when checking documents and looking for discrepancies, and while the complexity of the game increases as you progress, the financial demands placed on you will only go up, causing more and more stress as you can never afford to get complacent. You still need to take home a certain amount of money every day to keep your family alive, after all. While shifts are mostly made up of procedurally generated travellers, there are scripted events that take place on most days that move the story along or give you a difficult choice to make, with the game and story ending after 30 or so days. All of this is to say that Papers, Please does a really good job at making you feel like a cog in a heartless machine with a job you need to do competently, while also thinking about your own well-being, along with all the dilemmas that emerge when there's a conflict between the two. The tension in the story, trying to survive in a totalitarian state, is mirrored by the tension in the gameplay, trying to work quickly and bring home enough money without making mistakes, 
while always knowing the price of failure. Now, I'm not saying that Shipbreaker should have included ethical problems for the player to solve in every work shift, but the tension in the gameplay just isn't there to match the tension present in the story, between Lynx and the growing influence of the workers' union. Here's an example to show you what I mean. Not too far into Shipbreaker, one of your colleagues gifts you with an old personal ship, and with it the secondary task of gathering components to bring it up to working order. Of course you have to steal those components from the ships you salvage in the yard, sometimes even destroying valuable salvage and missing out on bonuses in order to do so. At a glance this looks like an interesting decision to give the player, making them choose between satisfying their own goals and performing their job as expected. In practice, however, there's no real choice to be made here. Thanks to the infinite number of ships and the infinite amount of time you have, you might as well just steal the components whenever you see them, regardless of whether it destroys salvage, because you can always make that money back on the next ship. There's absolutely no trade-off to be made here by the player, just a prolonging of the game's runtime. This side goal of stealing components is by no means the only missed opportunity to inject some tension into the gameplay. During Shipbreaker's second act, Hal, an administrator from Lynx, comes to your station to investigate reports of Union activity. Up to this point you've been told through dialogue and emails about the growing conflict between Lynx and Union organisers, but never seen any of this conflict for yourself. After Hal's arrival, however, no, just kidding, absolutely nothing changes about the way you play the game. You'll hear him berate your colleagues and revoke their privileges as punishment for talking back, and you'll probably dislike him for it. But listening to conversations about unrealistic salvage targets being raised even higher rings hollow when you never experienced any targets like that in the first place. You're told that your team has demanding quotas to fill, but you can waste shift after shift doing nothing and the game won't react to it at all. When the tension being suggested by the story isn't being felt in the gameplay, it falls flat. And as far as the player's experience is concerned, Lynx is all talk and no walk. There are no long-term penalties whatsoever for destroying materials and losing the company profits, despite every bit of dialogue suggesting that there should be. You can also abandon a ship halfway through, and you won't see any kind of penalty or fine for wasted and unprocessed materials. In fact, it's actually quite easy to make a tidy profit on each shift without really trying, which doesn't exactly make you feel like you're being exploited. Implementing penalties for destroyed or unsorted materials at the end of a shift would go a long way towards making the player feel the same way about Lynx as the characters do. It may have been brutal from a gameplay stance, but isn't that supposed to be the point? It also would have encouraged the player to take more risks in the name of squeezing more profit out of each shift, which again is supposed to be the point. Maybe if you didn't hit your target for each shift, Lynx could take away your communication privileges. Preventing the player from reading emails or hearing comms messages like this could actually be a pretty good way of stopping the story from advancing if you earned a shift below target. You could then try again until you made your quota and regained access to your emails and the next story beat. If Shipbreaker had 25 or so unique ships that you progressed through day by day, I think it really would have benefited both the gameplay and the story. They always could have included an endless mode with some randomization for those who wanted it. I understand that at this point I'm basically talking about changing the entire structure of the game from a sandbox to a more linear level-based game, but as it stands I think the Shipbreaker loses far more than it gains by being a sandbox, both in terms of giving the player interesting things to do, and in terms of that gameplay's relevance to the story being told. At the end of the day, as a sandbox game, Shipbreaker's mechanics really aren't very complex and once you've seen all of the ship designs, it starts to get repetitive fast. Even later when you have to consider things like pressurization, power supplies and reactor meltdowns, you're still just getting inside, pointing at yellow spots and sorting the resulting debris. The fact that every ship of each model all have their cut points in the same place means that you'll be doing the same thing every time, and won't often get to make use of the more freeform line cutter. Before long, the only thing pushing you forward will be the novelty of each new unlocked ship, and maybe a desire to see how the story pans out. To be clear, simple mechanics are not necessarily a bad thing. All you do in Papers, Please is look for discrepancies between documents. But in that game, there's another layer above that. The daily time limit and the knowledge that every failure has consequences elevates the whole game into a really tense experience. 
Imagine if Papers Please gave you unlimited time and let you choose how long to spend on each day, and I think you'll agree just how quickly it would kill the game's core hook, to say nothing of how it would undermine the themes of the story. It's honestly a real shame that Shipbreaker's gameplay has no sense of urgency pushing you to optimise, because there are a few tricks you can learn as you play that save time when salvaging a ship. Sadly, I ended up discovering and using these tricks simply because I couldn't be bothered to do it the slow way, rather than as a calculated trade-off between time and money, which obviously would have been more compelling. Even so, here's a good example of a time-saving trick. Eventually you'll figure out that not all salvage is created equal, and that the metal for depositing into the furnace is worth far less than the components destined for the processor or the barge. Because of this I found that it was easily worth it to basically write off the furnace metal entirely, in the interest of salvaging the more valuable materials more quickly. When I'd finished dealing with the valuable hull materials and placed them all in the processor, generally I would be left with a furnace metal frame that was full of valuable electronics that needed placing on the barge. Since the barge components are worth so much more than the metal frame, I found that it was almost always worth it to just drop the entire frame onto the barge, losing out on salvaging the metal frame, but saving the time it would have taken to remove each component and place them on the barge individually. Later in the game, when the ships in the yard become truly massive, and their furnace metal frames are too big to move manually or by tether, I would have to cut the frames in half using my line cutter in order to make moving them more manageable. The game presented me with a problem, and I used the tools available to me to come up with a solution. I only wish it was the mechanics of the game itself that pushed me to do this, rather than my own boredom and desire to make the game end more quickly. Here's another trick I had to learn for myself while playing. You're told that removing coolant canisters and disengaging thrusters will increase the length of time you have before a reactor melts down, and this is true. What you're not told, however, is that doing both of these things will cause the reactor to start melting down immediately, which will likely lead to an intense and panicked rush to deal with the situation before you get vaporised. Or at least, that's what will happen the first time, because you won't fall for this twice, and you'll be expecting it, and likely preparing for it, in every subsequent shift. A bit of unpredictability in the triggering of the reactor meltdown could have gone a long way towards making this more interesting. And in fact, predictability is one of the biggest enemies of Shipbreaker's gameplay. Once you've worked out the most efficient way of gutting a ship, it will quickly become repetitive. And on that note, let's quickly talk about the game's variety of ships. There are around a dozen ship designs, and while each individual ship does have slight randomizations, it's nowhere near enough to prevent you from using the same basic strategy on every single one. The majority of the ships you salvage are industrial in nature, which definitely fits the game's theme of capitalism's obsession with productivity, but as usual I think there's some missed potential here for showing a more human story. What if one day you started your shift and you were disassembling somebody's home after they missed a payment on it, or because it was in the way of asteroid mining interests? That would have been consistent with the game's themes, while still offering the chance to engage with a more personal story. At one point in the story, your most pro-union colleague, Lou, is fired and forced to leave the station and crew behind. For a demoralizing twist, you could have started your next shift and realized that you were being made to disassemble Lou's habitat. Perhaps while doing so, you could have found some messages that she left behind. As usual, I'm not trying to claim that these ideas are amazing and would turn the game into a masterpiece. My aim is just to point out that so much more could have been done to integrate the gameplay and story of Shipbreaker and the game could only have benefited from it. Thankfully, when it comes to the ending, the game takes a tentative step in the right direction, though of course I'm still going to complain and say that it doesn't go far enough. As the days go by and Hal continues to make your team's lives miserable, or at least, as we're told that's what's happening because nothing at all changes for the player, things come to a head when Lou returns from her exile with a proposal from the growing Salvage Workers Union. The plan is to use industrial action to show Lynx who really controls the company's profits, by destroying the value of the ships in everybody's next shift, and hitting Lynx in the only place it cares about. Sure enough, this makes for a nice change of pace at first, and it's a memorable and enjoyable ending, as well as being one of the only times the story and gameplay align in a satisfying way. It goes on just a bit too long, however, and once you've had your fun destroying the explosive parts of the ship with demo charges, 
You're back to throwing stuff into the furnace or processor just like you would be on any other shift, except you're throwing them into the wrong one on purpose. If the impact of explosive components was bigger, then more of the ship could have been destroyed in the blast, and this underwhelming come down might have been avoided. But with the way the frame rate tanks at the relatively small explosions in the game now, maybe that wouldn't have been feasible. In any case, I still don't think this final level goes quite far enough, not least because you spend most of it doing the same thing you've been doing for the whole game. What if instead of destroying a normal ship, you spent this final level dismantling the station itself? If you'd spent the game upgrading the power of your tools, only to have them eventually become strong enough to take apart the station around you, that would have been a truly memorable and well-earned moment, and I think it actually might have made the game's point better than the lukewarm ending we got. As I wrap this up, I realise that I've probably come across really negatively about Shipbreaker, so I want to spend a little time praising where praise is due, because it's really not a bad game. When I said earlier that your main motivation for sticking through to the end of Shipbreaker will be a desire to unlock and see the next new ship, or to see the story's conclusion, that wasn't necessarily a negative criticism. While the ships eventually do become repetitive once you've seen them enough times, getting access to a new one for the first time is almost always an exciting milestone. But again, this makes me think that leaning into that and just having 25 unique ships or structures with a single shift each would have been a better call than the procedural generation we got. Still, the novelty of the game as a whole is one of its greatest strengths, and I'd probably recommend the game to anyone just off the back of that alone. There aren't a lot of games that try to do something like this, and Shipbreaker deserves some credit for giving it a pretty good try. The sound design of Shipbreaker in particular is truly excellent. The bluegrass guitar tunes give you the feeling of living and working on a frontier, and easily could have carried the game on their own but the devs went a step further with it and added dynamic music that kicks in whenever you're doing something particularly hazardous, like trying to deal with a ship's reactor before it melts down. In these moments, a heart-stopping synth track gets added to the music, which drives up the tension and underscores just how dangerous the work you're doing is. The power of the machines you're taking apart isn't just felt in the gameplay, it invades the music with an unnatural edge that drives the point home hard every time. For all my complaints about the story's lack of integration into the gameplay, taken in isolation, which is basically the only way to take it in this game, the story is a fairly nuanced one, or at the very least it's better than I was expecting it to be. In the real world, evil corporations don't just suddenly appear at the will of an evil board of directors. They're made up of a long chain of rational people, each acting in their own best interests at the expense of everyone else. It would have been quite easy to make Hal into a one-dimensional villain who acted like a dickhead for no reason. And he is still a dickhead, but at least he has a reason. Hal gets a monologue of his own that humanises him and gives him a chance to talk about his perspective on his role inside Lynx. After the incident where one of your colleagues is almost killed, the ending brings things to a believable conclusion when Hal gets thrown under the bus so that the CEOs can walk away from the controversy scot-free, and learns the hard way what you could say is the moral of the story. If you try to play them at their own, individualistic, ruthless game, you will always lose to someone more ruthless than you. The solution is to band together with those whose interests align with yours, and work together to change the rules of the game. All in all, the story told by Shipbreaker feels like a very plausible one, and I can see how a mutinous conflict would arise between the labourers doing dangerous work out in space, and the owners sitting in an office and profiting from that work. It's just a shame that the gameplay does nothing to make the player a part of that conflict. So, returning to that question I raised at the beginning of this video, does Shipbreaker succeed at turning destruction physics into an interesting game mechanic? Well, the answer is yes and no. On its own, the core loop of getting inside a ship, separating its pieces, and sorting them into the right coloured box is enjoyable and technically impressive at first, but it gets old fast, and it's simply not enough to carry a game all on its own. Just as a first person shooter needs to be about more than just pointing and clicking on targets, and Papers, Please is about more than just comparing documents, Shipbreaker needed another layer on top of those simple mechanics to give the player some compelling gameplay decisions to make. What's really frustrating is that the game is so close to having that extra layer to it, but it doesn't stick the landing. I'll refrain from whipping out the L word here, but over and over again in Shipbreaker, there's a clear dissonance between what the story tells us and what we experience for ourselves while playing. 
This clash between the overly forgiving freeform gameplay and the story's theme of cold capitalistic greed is the fault line that runs right down the middle of Shipbreaker. Clearly the devs wanted to tell a linear story, but they wanted to make a sandbox game, and both sides suffered when they were forced to meet in the middle. Thank you.